Act 4, Midsummer Night's Dream. I've already, I think, if I've not confused this with another class, um, I've already posted the exam to D2L. It's under the content section. Just follow the directions carefully. Um, another little kind of a justification for taking this kind of course, you know, one that's based on fantasy literature or fairy tales, in the College of Liberal Arts' once a year publication, which is just called the College of Liberal Arts, I think. Um, they've got a thing about fairy tales in here. And there's a quote attributed to Albert Einstein. I just did a real quick search, and nobody can find where Einstein actually said this. So it's kind of a fairy tale that he actually said this. Um, but the quote is, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. That's one quote. The second quote is, when I examine myself and my methods of thought, I come to the conclusion that the gift of fantasy has meant more to me than any talent for abstract positive thinking. I find that very interesting, especially in light of what Tolkien says in that essay on fairy stories about logic in fantasy. That the more keener the logic, or more the more keener or clearer the reason or rationality, the better the fantasy will be. And he immediately then starts to talk about Lewis Carroll, okay, professor of geometry at Oxford, who also then wrote Through the Looking Glass, Alice in Wonderland, all those kinds of things. Okay? Um, all right, Act 4. So we left Act 3 with the four lovers falling asleep on the ground. Okay? Hermia is next to Lysander. Demetrius is next to Helena, All right? And Puck says at the very end of Act 3, On the ground sleep sound, I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover Rimadai. When thou wakes, thou takes true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eyes. Now this is when he's anointing Lysander's eyes. And the country proverb known that every man should take his own. In your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill. Knock shall go ill. That is, in the world will be right. Okay, There won't be problems. So, Act 4, Scene 1. We're still in the wood. Acts 2, 3, and 4 are at least partially in the wood. Act 2 and 3, or Acts 2 and 3, are entirely in the wood. Act 4 starts in the wood, and we see Titania come in with Bottom and the other um, fairies. Okay. And there's talk that goes on between them for a little bit. Bottom asks the fairies for some uh, food or delights and such. And then Puck comes in, and Puck meets with Oberon. And Oberon says, Welcome, good Robin. Seest thou this sweet sight? This is line 45. Act 4, scene 1. Her dotage now I do begin to pity. In other words, it, it's kind of starting to wear on Oberon seeing Titania in love with this ass. For meeting her of late behind the woods, seeking sweet favors for this hateful fool, that is, she was out looking for goodies for bottom. Oberon says, I did upbraid her and fall out with her, for she his hairy temples, then had rounded with coronet of flesh, fresh and fragrant flowers, blah, 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 blah. So, when I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged my patience, I then did ask of her her changeling child, which straight she gave me. And her fairy sent to bear him to my bower in fairyland. And now I have the boy. In other words, this is the problem that separated them at the beginning. I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. This hateful imperfection. Why is it an imperfection? Think Tolkien's recovery. Is she seeing as she ought to see? Obviously not. Okay. And, gentle Puck, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain. 
that he, awaking when the other do, may all to Athens back again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. Let bottom think it was all a dream. It didn't really happen. Let the lovers think it was all a dream. It didn't really happen. But first I will release the fairy queen. Okay? He goes up to Titania, who's now asleep, Sprinkles the juice in her eyes. Be as thou wast want to be. That is, be as you used to be. See as thou wast want to see. See as you used to see. See clearly. What's he really saying there? How was she used to seeing in the past? Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't any discord, there wasn't any disharmony okay, between Oberon and Titania. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. My Oberon, what visions have I seen? Dreams. Methought I was enamored of an ass. Notice, she's looking up at Titania. She doesn't see what's right next to her. And he says... There lies your love. And he directs her attention to bottom. And she ought to have a very startled look on her face. How came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe his visage now. Why? She sees as she ought to see. Okay? Her lenses have been wiped clear. Silence a while. What does he mean? I'll tell you later. Robin, take off this head. Titania, music call. Strike more dead than common sleep of all these five descents. The and so she calls for music. The fairies come. They dance. Now thou and I are new in amity, Oberon says, line 86, meaning anew in friendship. Okay. And will tomorrow midnight solemnly dance in Duke Theseus' house triumphantly? In other words, three days have passed. Tomorrow's the fourth day. It's the new moon. It's the time for Theseus and Hippolyta's marriage. There shall the pairs of faithful lovers be wedded with Theseus. Have we heard anything about that? No. Okay. Oberon is essentially making a prophecy here. Okay. So Oberon and Titania leave, and we get Act 4, Scene 1. Theseus appears okay, with Hippolyta, Aegeus, and others. So they've now entered the wood. Okay. And he says, let's go on up to the mountaintop, mark the musical confusion, blah, 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 blah. Um, Theseus, line 126. But soft, what nymphs are these? He sees Hermia and Helena. Aegeus, my lord, this is my daughter here asleep. And this Lysander. Well, and here's Demetrius. And here's Helena. I wonder of their being here. I wonder their... The word wonder means I'm amazed. He's dumbfounded. Right? He has no inkling, no idea of what this means. Okay? Theseus, well, they obviously got up early to do the rite of May, first of May rites. And he says, uh, Aegeus, isn't this the day Hermia has to give her answer? He says, it is. Well, let's Let's see what answer she's going to give. Wake him up. So the huntsman blows his horn, or the huntsmen blow their horns, and the lovers wake up, and then they kneel before Theseus. And Theseus says, I pray you all stand up. I know you two are rival enemies, that is, Demetrius and Lysander. How comes this gentle concord in the world? That is, what made you friends again? What brought about peace? 
That hatred is so far from jealousy, to sleep by hate and fear no enmity. Lysander, uh, I shall reply amazedly. That is, I'm taking a stab at this because I don't understand it. Amazedly means I am filled with astonishment also. I cannot truly say how I came here. He doesn't remember the night before. But as I think, okay, now here's what I do remember. Hermia and I came here to escape Athens' law and to be wed. Aegeus, that's it. That's enough. That's all I need to hear. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away. They would. Demetrius, thereby to have defeated you and me, you of your wife, me of my consent. My lord, little change here. Fair Helen told me of their stealth. Prior to this, has you been calling Helen fair or Helen a fair? No. Okay. And he says, and I in fury followed them. He was so angry that Demetrius and Hermia were going to try to stop him from being able to marry Hermia. In anger, he followed them into the wood, which is a good place for anger to be, right? Because the wood is a place of passion, chaos. Fair Helena and fancy, that is, in fantasy, imagination, following me, but I know not by what power my love to Hermia melted as the snow. And it seems to me now as the remembrance of an idol god. A god is, is like showy ornamentation. Real bright bling, in other words. Which in my childhood I did dote upon. Notice, in my childhood. He's saying, yeah, I doted upon Helena in my childhood. He's saying, though, now... I'm grown up. Excuse me, Hermia in my childhood. And now the object and the pleasure of mine eye is only Helena. To her was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia. Okay. Betrothal is important. It's more than just being engaged. It's about the same as marriage, but you haven't consummated the marriage. So, but like a sickness did I loathe this food, but as in health, come to my natural state. In other words, he's saying, I'm now fully healthy. Why? Because I see Helena as I ought to see her. Theseus, fair lovers, you are fortunately met. It's as if he's saying, fortune, the goddess has smiled down upon you and brought order out of disorder. Okay. We'll hear more about this later. Now, Aegeus, I'm going to overrule you. For in the temple, these couples shall eternally be knit. There won't just be one wedding tonight. But there's going to be three weddings tonight. Okay. So, Theseus, Hippolyta, their train leave, and we have the four lovers left behind. And they're like, ah, I don't understand what just happened. Are we sure we're awake? Demetrius asks. It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream. Wasn't the Duke just here? Hermia, yeah, my father, and Hippolyta, and he bid us follow to the temple. Okay, then we're awake. They leave, and Bottom wakes up. And Bottom says, I have had a most rare vision. I've had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Okay, past the wit of man. Past the intelligence of man to say what the dream was. And yet, what does Bottom do? Attempts to say what the dream was. Methought I was... There's no man can tell what. Methought I was, and methought I had, but man is but a patched fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. The eye of man hath not heard. Well, does the eye hear? Obviously not. The ear of man hath not seen. 
Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. And what Bottom is doing there is he is misparaphrasing, misalluding to a passage in the writings of St. Paul, okay, where Paul describes or writes about heaven and says, The eye of man hath not seen, nor the ear of man heard the glory that is to come. Okay? I'll get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream, and it shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. That is, it hath no ending. It just kind of keeps going on. It's like an onion. You just keep peeling layers and layers back. Okay? Scene two. The mechanicals, the actors, the clowns are going through their parts, and Bottom shows up. Okay. Then we go to Act 5. Where are we? We're back in Athens. Okay. So the play begins and ends in Athens. And everything in the middle, Acts 2 through 4, all happens in the wood. All, right. all happens in the place of imagination, of fantasy, of Lack of logic, of unreason, of chaos. Athens is the seat of reason, order. So, Hippolyta says, "'Tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of, that that means that which. It's strange what these lovers are talking about, what they've experienced in the wood. Theseus, more strange than true. I never may believe these antic fables, nor these fairy toys. That is, or these stories about fairies. And he gives us this nice little speech that partly, I think, tells us a little bit about what Shakespeare has to say about poetic inspiration and... Um, Love inspiration. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cruel reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. I'm going to read the whole speech and then we'll take your part. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That's the madman. The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks, excuse me, such tricks have strong imagination that if it would be if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? Go back to the beginning almost. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains. What does it mean to seethe? How do we use that word today? It's usually used only in one context. Yeah, if somebody's angry, they're seething. So what does that mean? They're consumed. They're boiling in anger. Seething literally is, a, is referring to boiling. Okay. So, lovers and madmen have boiling brains. Well, what? does that mean? Have you ever had a real high fever? I don't mean 101, 102, I mean 104. 104.5. What happens when you have a fever that high? Well, what often happens, it doesn't always, but what often happens is you hallucinate. Which means what? That aren't real. 
you see things that aren't real. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies. Fantasies here refers to the mind. The mind does what? It shapes things that apprehend, okay, apprehend means takes hold of, more than cool reason ever comprehends. What does comprehend mean? Doesn't mean takes hold of. It means understands, perceives, okay? So lovers and madmen have brains that shape fantasies that apprehend things. Things that cool reason, what? Doesn't understand. Okay? That's his basis point. That's his foundation for the rest of the speech. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. All compact means they're of the same. These guys are composed of the same stuff, imagination. Lunatic, lover, poet. Okay? One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That's the madman. That's the lunatic. Because the lunatic sees Shakespeare's day, this was the, the belief, devils everywhere. Okay? The lover... All as frantic. Well, what does it mean if you're frantic? Are you acting rationally? No, you're not. You're acting kind of crazy. Okay? The lover, notice, all as crazy sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. A brow of Egypt. That means a dark-skinned person. Like an Egyptian. Okay? Doesn't necessarily mean black. It can mean dark brown. Okay? So what does he mean? Well, in you have to understand the Renaissance or Elizabethan conception of beauty. Beauty, to a Renaissance thinker, was like this. Okay? Look at the difference between the white on this and the white on this. Right? This is white, white, which is why you can see portraits of Queen Elizabeth and her face looks powdered because it was powdered with white, like <clears throat> powdered sugar. Okay, That was the conception of beauty, really white, white. Okay, why? No idea. Okay. Well, it might have made them look younger, but I mean, there was also this uh, arising during the Elizabethan period, this, this idea of artificiality made you more beautiful, okay? So you'd have really white face, really red lips, lipstick. Uh, Queen Elizabeth herself had really black teeth because she loved sugar and they didn't understand, you know, sugar rots teeth and such. So... When he says, the lover, all his frantic, see Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt, he's not talking Helen here, Helena in the play. He's talking about the ancient Greek myth of Helen of Troy, who had the face that launched a thousand ships. She was so, beauty, Afro, so beautiful, Aphrodite was jealous of her, the goddess of beauty. Okay? So he's saying the lover would see the epitome of beauty in essentially black woman. If we were reading Shakespeare's sonnets, you would find out beginning, he wrote 154 of them, beginning with sonnet 127, they are addressed to, generally speaking, the dark lady. Okay? A lot of people read those things biographically and say Shakespeare had an affair with a black woman. Some people have actually even identified this black woman who was, I don't even remember, um, a mistress of somebody really powerful. I can't remember her name. Okay? So, the poet, excuse me, the lover 
in the madman so far. What about the poet? The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling, meaning his eye is just kind of rolling around in his head like he's really lost everything, lost touch with reality. Does what? The poet glances from heaven to earth and earth to heaven, meaning the poet writes about everything. Everything in existence, everything from the details of life to God in heaven. And what does he do? And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown. Think about that for a moment. Imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown. What did Shakespeare, what did Tolkien say in that fairy story essay? Okay. He said you have the image or the idea. You have art or technique. And what does it produce? It produces the sub-creation. Okay? Shakespeare is saying, imagination bodies forth. These are the things unknown. Why? Because they're only known to the creator up here. And so what does he do? He, I'm going to use a word, create a word. He imaginates it, and what do we get? We get the bodies forth. And, you know, fails. <coughs> the poet, Theseus is saying, has the idea and does what? Creates it. Puts it into a body, a place, a time. Bodies forth the forms of things unknown. The poet's pen does what? Turns them to shapes. And gives to airy nothing, because where does that actually really exist? Where does bottom really exist? Up here. And gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. The wood, Athens, Venice. Such tricks have strong imagination that if it would but apprehend some joy. If the imagination would reach for some joy, what must it do? It comprehends some bringer of that joy. That is, the imagination says... If I've experienced some joy, then what must lie behind that? Something that creates that joy. That is, the imagination looks for meaning. It tries to make sense out of reality. And he gives an example. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? Or maybe use another example. You're a little kid. You go to bed at night. You don't put all your clothes away. You've got a coat hanging up somewhere, on like on a bedpost. And there's just enough light shining through your window from the street lamp to create shadows. And so that coat hanging up in your semi-awake sleep now takes on the form of what? A person. A stranger. Right. Why? Because it really is? No. Because the imagination, imagining some fear, does what? Bodies forth. A person, a place, etc. Hippolyta. Okay. So they listen to the speech, and Hippolyta says, yeah, that doesn't really explain it. Because all their minds transfigured so together... They all had the same dream, the same vision? No. That more witnesseth than fancies images. That's more than mere fantasy, she's saying. And grows to something of great constancy. Great constancy means both great consistency. They all say the same thing. But also she means 
of great import, great moment, great meaning. There's, there's some truth to this. Okay? So the lovers come in. And Theseus asks for Philostrate to come in to find out what plays and masks and revels they're going to have for the wedding. And Philostrate hands him a piece of paper, and so he starts to read. And he reads over several. And you get down to line 56. Hmm. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love, Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. And Theseus kind of steps back. Wait, merry and tragical? Tedious and brief? Tedious means it's time-consuming. That is hot ice and wonders strange snow. How shall we find the discord, the concord of this discord? In philosophy, explains the play is ten lines long. That's a pretty short play. And he said, and um, says some other things. And Theseus, who are the players? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now. That is, manual laborers who never really worked with their minds before. They've not thought much. Theseus, we'll hear it. That's the one I want. No, no, really. It's not for you. I've, I've heard it over. And it is nothing, nothing in the world. Unless you can find sport in there, what? Intense. Unless you can find, by sport he means pleasure, entertainment. Unless you can find sport, pleasure, entertainment in there, intense. Extremely stretched, that is their intention, stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. They intend to please you, but their intention will be stretched to the maximum. What do you mean? They can't fulfill that intention. What will happen is instead, they will bring you pain and not pleasure. Thesis, I will hear that play. Notice why he says, For never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. What's he saying? Notice, the clowns are simple, right? They're not intellectuals. They're common kind of lower class individuals. How are they, or why are they intending to put on this play? As a show of affection and as a show of duty to Duke Theseus. He says, never anything can be amiss when simpleness, simpleness here means not only, you know, low IQ, but it also means um, sincerity and duty tendered. No matter what they actually do, their intention is right. Okay? It's like having a three-year-old who's gotten into a box of crayons on a piece of white paper and has drawn something, and the three-year-old brings it to you. You've got Two possible replies. It's a piece of garbage, throw it away. Come back with a real drawing. In which case, what have you done to the child? You've killed that desire to please. Or you could say, wow, that's beautiful. In which case, what have you done to that child? You've raised them up. You've lifted them up. Okay? Hippolyta, oh, I love not to see wretchedness overcharged. She translates simpleness into wretchedness. They're not just simple folk. They are wretched folk. They are the lowest of the low. Okay. A duty in his service perishing, that is, Duty, in attempting to perform duty, dying in the act. It won't be achieved. 
Theseus, a gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. But he says they can do nothing in this kind. He says they can what? They can't do this play. They can't pull it off. Theseus, the kind are we to give them thanks. What? For nothing. What's he saying? Then we shall be even more kind by doing what? Offering them thanks for the nothing they've given us. Okay? So what does he mean? Our sport, that is our pleasure, our entertainment, shall be to take what they mistake. Our entertainment shall be to do what? To receive as if they have given. Our sport, pleasure, entertainment will be to watch their play and enjoy it as a play even though they don't properly perform it. And what poor duty cannot do that is, their duty to us. Noble respect. Whose respect? Takes it in might, not merit. Noble respect. He's not talking about bottoms and Peter Quinces and starlings and snouts. Respect for Theseus and Apollota. He's talking about his respect to them. Wait. He's at the top of the ladder. They're at the bottom of the ladder. Why should he respect them? What are they attempting? They are attempting to honor him. And he is saying, and we should show respect to that attempt to honor us. Take it in might, not merit. What does it mean, take it in might? We should take it in what ability they have to achieve it, not in whether they actually do achieve it. Okay? This would be like, I'm not going to, okay, but this would be a good example of it. This would be like, instead of my grading your papers on the basis of what they merit or deserve, it would be like my taking every one of your papers and giving it back to you with an A and saying, whether it deserved it or not, and saying, you've achieved this grade because of the attempt you've made. Okay? Rather than the performance you've achieved on it. So, he goes on. And he gives an example. Where I have come... That is, where in the past I have gone to, great clerks have purposed to greet me with premeditated welcomes. That is, ambassadors have come out and they've attempted to greet me with great high-sounding words. Where I have seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst of sentences, that is, they stopped in the middle of sentences, and throttled their practiced accent in their fears, and they haven't spoken clearly. And in conclusion, they have dumbly broke off not paying me a welcome. In other words, they've just kind of stuttered. Okay? Trust me, sweet. Out of this silence, yet I picked a welcome. He understands. They did their best. And in the modesty of fearful duty, I read as much as from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. I've heard as much from the stumbling, stuttering fool as from the person who comes up and speaks with flowing eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity in least speak most to my capacity, that is, to my understanding. Love in simplicity 
speak volumes to my ears. So, Philosophy comes in, and he announces the prologue. Peter Quince comes in and delivers his prologue. Look how it is punctuated. Okay? If we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend, but with good will. To show our simple skill, that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then, we come but in despite. We do not come as minded to content you, our true intent is. All for your delight, we are not here. That you should here repent you, the actors are at hand. And by their show, you shall know all that you would like to know. Okay, now Theseus just talked about people coming out to greet him and putting stops, periods, in the midst of their sentences. That's exactly what Peter Quince has just done with that prologue. He's misspoken. The prologue should read something like, um, If we offend... It is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend. Period. But with good will to show our simple skill. That is the true beginning of our end. Period. Consider them we come. But in despite we do not come as minding to content you. Our true intent is all for your delight. We are not here that you should hear repent you. The actors are at hand, and by their show you shall know all that you are like to know. Theseus, this fellow doth not stand upon points, meaning he doesn't understand where the period should be. Okay. So they talk back and forth. Quince comes in, keeps doing the prologue, and we see the play within the play. Right? Uh, which I'm going to skip most of. Snug comes in as lion. Notice he addresses the audience. He wants to make sure the ladies aren't fearful of lion. Okay? Then we see flute enter as Thisbe. And Bottom comes in. Bottom kills himself as Pyramus. Flute comes in again as Thisbe. Thisbe sees dead Pyramus, and Thisbe dies. And Theseus says, um, Act 5, line 333 or thereabouts, Moonshine and Lion are left to bury the dead. Demetrius, I, and Wall, too. Okay. Thisbe and Pyramus are dead on the stage. And Bottom rises up. Or Pyramus. And says, No, I assure you, the wall is down that parted their fathers. Will it please you to see the epilogue? In other words, he breaks character. Okay. Theseus, no, no, no epilogue, I pray you. Your play needs no excuse. Never excuse. For when the players are all dead, there need none to be blamed. Okay? But come, your burgomaster, that is, come out, do your little dance. The company return, they do their dance. And Theseus says, all right, lovers, to bed. Tis almost fairy time. That is, it's almost time for the fairies to come out. I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn, as much as this we this night have overwatched. So sweet friends to bed. So they all go to bed. Puck enters. Now the hungry lion roars, and the wolf, the wolf behowls the moon, whilst the heavy plowman snores, all with weary task fordone. Now the wasted brands do glow, whilst the screech all screeching loud puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night that the graves all gaping wide. Everyone lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to guide. There's this old uh, 
English kind of popular mythology that says around midnight the graves open up and the dead arise. And they walk the earth essentially as ghosts. And we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate stream from the presence of the sun, following darkness like a dream, now are frolic. Not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Oberon and Titania and all the fairies come in. Okay. And Oberon says, 384, Now until the break of day, through this house each fairy stray. To the best bred bride bed will we, which by us shall blessed be. So Oberon and Titania, who are reunited in perfect peace and amity, are going to Theseus and Hippolyta's bedroom, and they are going to bless their marriage. All right? And the issue there created, the offspring of Theseus and Hippolyta, ever shall be fortunate. So shall all the couples three ever true in living be, loving be. And the blots of nature's hands shall not in their issue stand. That is, there won't be ch any children born with any kind of birth defect. Nor mole, never mole, hair lip, nor scar, nor mark prodigious, such as are despised in nativity, shall upon their children be. With this field do consecrate. That is, make holy. Every fairy take his gate, and each several chamber blessed through this palace with sweet peace. So all the fairies are going to go through all the rooms and sprinkle this dew like a baptism almost. Okay? Everybody leaves but Puck. If we shadows have offended, Think but this, and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this weak and idle theme. What's the title of the play? A Midsummer Night's Dream. And this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Well, how much does a dream interfere with everyday real life. You wake up, and what happens? It's gone. It's gone. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to escape the serpent's tongue, boo, hiss. Okay? We will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar calls. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. Give me your hands means applause. Okay? So what's Puck saying in the final speech, the epilogue to the poem? Excuse me, to the play. And if they did a good job, give them an yeah, if we did a good job and yeah, if we did a bad job, boo us. But what else? What's he saying the entire play was? A dream. It was all a dream. And how much import will that dream have on your going forth from this place? None. None. That's why he says, if we... Uh, if we shadows have offended. If we've done slash said anything that has offended you, think but this, and all is mended. How offensive is a dream? Not really. You have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. Now, who could be offended? Well, maybe there are fathers out in the audience. Who are going through similar situations with their daughters. And what is the play shown? Possible solutions to those problems? What else does the play show? How about attitudes, behavior of nobility to those beneath them? It's an interesting thought. Because Theseus says, 
we should show respect to them. We should honor what they attempt to do in honor of us. Okay? Yeah, that could be offensive language to a lot of people. Okay, we'll stop there. As I said, the exam is on the website. Um, it's due a week from today, the 29th, beginning of class. Uh, I think I've got a little comment on there. If you come in like 10 minutes late and you give it to me then, it'll be Doc 1 letter grade. Okay? If you come in at the end of class, it's an F. So be here at the beginning of class. Follow the directions on it. I think there are I think there's four topics. Yeah. Just choose one. Some of you have already seen it apparently.